Well, hello, guys and gals. It's good to be with you again for our adult Sunday school lesson, and we are finishing out our current quarter. This is our last Sunday in this unit, and we actually have about 13 more Sundays if it stays on pace for where we uh, or how we've been doing this for the last five quarters. 13 more Sundays before we are completely done with our Old Testament study, and we roll over into the New Testament, starting with the Gospel of John. So, Next quarter, we'll see us study some works that put us in the period of the exile, namely looking at Jeremiah, beginning of the exilic period, and then Daniel, uh, Esther a little bit. And then, of course, we'll start looking at some other post-exilic works, such as Ezra and Nehemiah um, and Malachi. So with that, uh, we've still got quite a bit of territory to cover, and it's going to be a a bit more of a hodgepodge of things than we're kind of used to, perhaps, but that's okay. Uh, I'll try my best, by God's grace, to work in some things to make this a little bit more cohesive, um, keep something of a timeline going for us, but more or less taking time to look at what the period of the exile and the post-exilic period is doing and looking at these biblical themes that we've already laid down and we've reiterated and made a point to reemphasize plentifully uh, over these last several months, and then how that is setting us up for how the New Testament authors and the storyline, the compilation of the New Testament itself, as goes the books and how they're arranged uh, and whatnot, are, allow, are going to allow us to look at those themes as well until we eventually culminate with the final book of Scripture, Revelation, which is still a ways away. You know, it's summer of 2024 when we will find out, finally finish up our trek through this three-year cycle of the Gospel Project. So we've got a long time to go yet, or a, a long ways yet to go, I should say, and a, a lot of ground yet to cover. So anyway, this last Sunday, using the word hosh posh, uh, or phrase, I guess, uh, we have probably the biggest smattering of Scripture that we've ever had. Uh, in any one of these lessons. And as you see me scrolling on the screen here, these are not even all of our passages that we're going to be looking at. Um, well, let me rephrase that. It is all the passages we are going to be looking at. It was not all that was assigned. Uh, the entirety of Acts 17 uh, was also given to us to read, but considering all of these passages that we have and just the simple fact it would take too long to work through all of that, but it is a very good passage to tack on to the end of this. So I encourage you after this lesson or, oh, excuse me, after I read these passages, if you want to pause this and then go read the contents of Acts 17 and then come back and listen to the lesson. Uh, however you feel led to do that, that'd be fine. But anyway, so we're going to be looking at a few Old Testament passages exclusively from Genesis and then from Romans, 2 Corinthians, back to Luke 10. And then, as you heard me say, uh, Acts 17. So let's go ahead and jump on in and read here. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Now to chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the, tree, fruit from the trees in the garden. But about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it, or you will die. No, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now to chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. So this is the document containing the family, family records of Adam. On the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created the male and female using the same uh, formula that we have back in Genesis chapter 1. When they were created, he blessed them and called them mankind. Adam was 130 years old when he fathered a son in his likeness, according to his image, a man named uh, and named him Seth. Now all the way to Romans chapter 1, 18 through 25. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness 
suppress the truth, since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse, for though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show him gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what has been created instead of the Creator, who is praised forever. Amen. Now to Paul's letter to the churches in Corinth, 2 Corinthians three seventeen through 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And this is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Lastly, Luke 10, 25 through 37. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, to him being Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law? Jesus asked him. How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. So do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him, and fled, leaving him half dead. The priest happened to be going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Now, which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, the lawyer said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. You'll join me now for a moment of prayer. Jesus, we are so very grateful, Lord, that you as our shepherd, as our king, have guided us through yet another week, ruling sovereignly over the cosmos. Every variable in every pocket of the cosmos that is outside of the scope of our knowledge of existence or even the few things that we know do that we might think we have some measure of control over, but ultimately we realize, Lord, that you are sovereign over all. And though you, as we just read these verses, have created us to be co-regents with you in ruling and exercising dominion over this territory that you have given us, this terrestrial realm that you have promised to us as an inheritance, yet we do not create it and we do not sustain it. We partner with you in working to make things from what you have given us to rule over and to even improve upon the existence that we share with each other and, of course, with you. Be that as it may, Lord. There's nothing that we can do to alter any of it, nor is there anything that we do to control anything, even within our own lives. For you, indeed, are almighty. We recognize that, and we are grateful for it. Because in recognizing that, Lord, it's a great sigh of relief that we get to breathe and knowing that I don't have to worry about controlling anything, but just simply give it over to you. And trust that you will do as you intend. Our Lord reigns in heaven. And he does as he pleases. So the psalmist says. And we rejoice in that. Lord as we have gathered here for this time. We pray that you would open our hearts. You would open our minds. You would help us to see how these stri scriptures connect with each other. How they have connected or will connect to the things that we have covered. And Lord may in time. 
as we cover, cover other areas and break into new ground. May some of these things continue to reverberate in the back of our minds as we continue to familiar, familiarize ourselves with the story of Scripture and with a keener understanding of what it is that you've been doing and what this story means as we approach you in the narrative, Jesus. The things that you proclaim, the things that you come to inaugurate, to bring into our existence, to define the concourse of human history for the last 2,000 years and what you are continuing to do even to this day. So as we look into these things, as we study these mysteries, Lord, we are in every way dependent upon you, the sovereign God, to do the work that only you can in opening us up uh, and stopping our deafened ears, opening our blinded eyes, softening our hardened hearts to your truth. And we ask you in your name that you be glorified. Amen. So just thinking on the subject of redeeming the image of God in broken humanity, or so that's how I'm going to try to see this. What my hope is, though, is that I don't really have to do a lot to explain anything. Hopefully, if you've been listening over these many months, if you've had the chance to tune in to several of these lessons, that in just reading the Word of God, as we finished doing a few minutes ago, uh, that number one, it was a blessing to you to just hear God's word being read. I mean, this is the promise that we get from John in the opening verses of Revelation, just hearing the words of that prophecy, which I think could apply to all of Scripture and hearing it read out loud. That's certainly the way that Jewish authors of the Old Testament construct every passage of Scripture in the way that it is for the sake of it being meditated upon, chanted even. So, the idea of being immersed in it and mulling it over um, the way that morbid as it might be, uh, a coroner might be describing a cadaver that has been brought in for autopsy and having to, with almost a proverbial fine tooth comb, comb through and sift every detail to try to forensically arrive at the plausible reason for death and then deliver that over in final analysis to those who will have to record that information and log it for what it is. And then of course, pass this on to those who need it, whether authorities or loved ones or both to get back to where we were. Point being is that as we comb through scripture and sift through these fine details, then we become more familiar with it. And of course, engaging as many senses as we can, it becomes easier and of course, more of the scripture itself is enlivened to us in a new way. And so I think if you were just listening to what I read, and if not, uh, not to say you weren't listening, but if you couldn't piece this together, then, you know, maybe you might want to go back and just take some time over a period of 20 or 30 minutes, a great exercise to take passages of scripture that are connected in the way that these are and just read through them and see how parts of the Bible that are rather far apart with the amount of pages that separate them. And of course, the events, the years and real space and time that separate these events uh, are moved out of the way. And this is compressed together in a way that we get to condense it down and see these movements touch each other uh, in a way that brings this part of the story, the theme that connects it all together uh, just really start to jump off the page for us. And so there are many different things that others could easily take from these passages and pick out as a sub theme that is uniting these together, one of which would be the kingdom of God. And if I had a time at the time to go back and look at all of them together or search through one from beginning to end and then go back and look for another, I would love to take the opportunity. But I just chose this one as I felt led by the Lord to put our attention and focus on this. But I certainly adjure you to do that very thing, perhaps on your own time. So I just want to go back and look at these passages in Genesis and try to appreciate how they are feeding information into the New Testament by looking at other passages that will develop after these moments early in the Genesis narrative and appreciate in these moments where we can focus the spotlight on a specific storyline and a person or people that we see what God has been doing to move his narrative forward and get us to where we are about to be 
in our study in the Old Testament as we leave this quarter behind and get us on into the last quarter, focusing on the Old Testament material after the exile. So in Genesis chapter 1, we see in verses 26 and 27, uh, one of the, excuse me while I take a drink. Quintessential, if not the fundamental passage in all of the Old Testament that makes it exquisitely clear what God was doing and the purpose behind why he created man in the first place. Now, certainly, this is not exhaustive in the sense that it speaks to everything or reason why God created mankind, because it's devoid of several things that we learn about God with respect to his desire for man, his connection relationally with mankind that we'll get from other parts of the narrative after this. We come to understand that not only is God infinitely loving, but that God loves mankind in a way that when we get to the New Testament narrative, we see the epitome of that measure. Sure, that's not encapsulated here in Genesis chapter one. But we do get a good purpose statement for why God even chooses to make man in the first place. And that is <clears throat> so that they will rule, right? They will rule, they will subdue. And they rule because they have been created in God's image. And we've understood as we've worked through this theme over these many months from studying in Genesis 1 up until now, that bearing God's image is not just an emotional thing, albeit in Western society. For hundreds of years now, that seems to have been the primary focus. When we use that phrase, image of God, we're speaking about the mental attributes that we might share with God. But in all likelihood, um, when we go back to the actual Hebrew rendering of the word image in and of itself, and the way it's used throughout all ancient Near Eastern cultures and various other Semitic languages or near Semitic languages, that that word itself is basically meant to, to connotate the idea of a statue that represents a king, or it could very well be a deity of sorts. But of course, that deity is fastened in, fashioned in an image that humanity itself has imagined, or so we would suppose. But a king, on the other hand, has perhaps commissioned that statue, and an artisan has carved it out in the likeness of that king to be placed in various other palaces or important government buildings or districts of his kingdom for the sake of people knowing that this realm belongs to that king and that the subjects of this realm are supposed to venerate that king, right? And so the idea then stems from this very concept here that mankind is the iconic representation of God. I'm not saying that God looks like a man in heaven. We understand from Jesus and John 4, God is spirit. But you understand what I'm driving at here. And then this plays in very well to the uh, opposite end of the idea or the converse of it, which would be, if I'm using that term correctly, it's either converse or inverse. Sometimes I mix them up. But nonetheless, the idea, let's just say it using the slang language that we can. The flip side of it would be that whereas Israel and the rest of mankind throughout much of ancient history has dedicated themselves to polytheism and worshiping various other deities, some may be amalgamations of men and animals or just men themselves. Uh, or, of course, goddesses adopting the female form. But the idea is that they are sharing with those images the thing that God has blessed them with, the fact that they represent his likeness to all creation, but choosing instead to defile that concept by giving that glory away to something they fashion with their hands that they think represents the image and likeness of a God <clears throat> and that they must be subservient to it rather than subduing and ruling over creation, which is what God had made them to do in the first place, is one of the reasons why idolatry is so egregious in and of itself is because it's casting off the very thing that God had blessed them with <clears throat> and choosing to eschew that blessing rather than embrace it for what it was. So with that, the idea is that man is crowned with glory. Psalm 8, right? That's the idea. Is even though he's made lower than the angels, and from the perspective of David in writing that psalm, it's like, you know, what are we compared to you that you would ever 
take notice of us, but understanding that you've made us and you made us just a little lower than the angels. You made us to crown us with glory and you have put everything under our feet. So venerating God for the fact that God has indeed coronated the first two human beings that he put in that garden in the context of Genesis 1 and 2 to rule over all creation and again to subdue it, not by force and violence, but for the simple sake of them improving upon the tapestry that God begins for them and then sharing with him in that creative attribute, improving upon what God has done by seeing what they will do to continue in not necessarily developing the garden, perhaps, but developing the world outside the garden that God has not fully cultivated in the same way that he has the Garden of Eden that he has hedged them into, right? So, of course, it's entirely possible that as time goes on, had Adam and Eve not sinned, and the story that we never got in Scripture, and that being the concept of humanity choosing to actually trust God in his definition of what was right and wrong and submit themselves to his authority in obedience to his command to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then life could have perhaps continued to evolve civically, if that's the proper term. What I mean by that is just civilization and advancements would perhaps have continued uh, as they did in the concourse of human history in the, uh, the context of Genesis chapter 3, after the, the murder of Abel and Cain and his descendants move eastward off into Nod and then begin to develop the very things that will define human civilization for thousands of years later. That being, of course, music, husbandry, as goes animals and agriculture and various things of the like that Adam and Eve and their descendants very well could have built the first city inside the garden. And there would have been nothing wrong with doing so. But nonetheless, I'm running down rabbit trails and I don't intend to do that. So with that, we get the synopsis here, in Genesis chapter one, that mankind is supposed to rule over the creation that God has made for them as co-regents with him, recognizing him as the potentate. In other words, the sovereign Lord that they alone are subject to in the sense that or I should say that he alone is the one thing that they are subject to while everything else is placed under their feet as much as it is his feet. So Genesis chapter three, we understand how this story will progress, though. The serpent, the Nakash, the shining one, comes into the garden and he tempts the woman. And you may remember way back when, when we first went through this, I was postulating for you what Many others have written upon and researched uh, in, in vast ways the concept that the serpent himself was not actually a creature that either crawled on four legs or slithered on the ground. And we don't have time to rehash all that now. I would have to refer you back to all of the, to that lesson way, way back when and the conversation we had there. But all that to simply say this perhaps and most likely was an end. Uh, a heavenly creature, one of God's divine council members that was choosing to rebel against God in this very moment and very well could have been the very creature that will go on to become the this, this satanic emis, uh, adversary that is spoken of in Job chapter 1 and also in the New Testament, the one who comes to tempt Jesus out in the wilderness and is spoken of by many of the Old Testament authors or New Testament authors as being the enemy of God's people. You'll notice I, I don't refer to Old Testament authors because there's a whole separate discussion with respect to the use of the Hebrew word Satan, spelled S-A-T-A-N, the same way we spell in English Satan, because that word is a Hebrew loan word brought into the English vernacular. But that word in its basic sense means adversary, and there are many people who are termed Satans in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and some of them are even angels and remain obedient servants to the Lord and are not rebelling against God like we think in the sense of Lucifer or demons, just using more modern, albeit middle age, um, iconography and uh, demonological references and so forth. But this is seemingly an, a heavenly creature, one of God's divine counsel, who is choosing to rebel against God. And he is enticing humanity to do the same thing. 
And what is the essence of this choice here? Well, the essence of the choice, I'm just going to get up for a quick second because I have a space heater on here and I need to turn it off because it's getting really warm in here. The essence of this choice that is seen in the two trees that are housed in the middle of the garden, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is that God has made it possible for them to eat of all the trees in the garden. He gives one simple command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but it in and of itself is a source of wisdom. And again, I would refer you back to those discussions if you want more detail, but a source of wisdom in that what it does endow a person with is a knowledge of what is right, what is wrong, what is in Hebrew referred to as tov and ra, good and bad. However, what the choice in and of itself represents is the notion what the serpent offers them here. And that is God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like him. You will know the difference between good and evil. That in and of itself is not a lie. They would know the difference between good and evil. And it wasn't that God wanted to ultimately withhold them that from them forever. It's the simple fact that he does lie when he goes beyond this to say that you will not certainly die should you partake of it. God said they would. And in choosing to not believe that, they want they refuse to trust God. And they want what is offered by <clears throat> the shining one in the garden. And that simply is the presumed power to be able to make the choice of defining right and wrong for themselves rather than having to trust God to do that for them. So in essence, what they are choosing for themselves is the very thing that God has given them, all of creation to rule over and that everything is subject to them. And instead of them having to be subject to God and let him define what is right and wrong, trust in his wisdom, and then again, be subservient to his authority, they get to decide what is right and wrong and rule over the world apart from God. So God gives them the very thing that they want through the instant of the fall, and then what ensues after this in the chapters that lead us all the way up to the flood narrative of Genesis 6 through 9. And that is the understanding, the consequence that God allows them to partake of, and of course, they cannot reverse and go back to what was there before is that they get this world where they get to rule over everything seemingly apart from God. And they get to define right and wrong for themselves. But what happens? Well, in the context of Genesis 3, 4, 5, on into 6, it's chaos. Everything begins to unwind and devolve until it gets to the point where we notice in the opening uh, verses of chapter 6 that God regrets that he made mankind. And he notices that the thought and intent of every man's heart is evil all the time. And so then God makes the choice to then destroy everything that has the breath of life, with the exception of what he chooses to salvage in the ark. So all that to say that obviously in those few chapters, we see a broken world, a broken world in which everything humanity is attempting to try to do to seemingly fix that brokenness. It's never put to us quite like that, but it seems as though that's what's going on. <clears throat> Humming under the surface there is the tendency or desire for humanity to find a way back beyond the cherubim into the garden. But it never quite works out that way. And when I say that, that may be something that throws you off. You're like, what do you mean trying to get back beyond the cherubim? Well, remember, the cherubim who were once walking around in the garden at peace with Adam and Eve are now their, their adversaries that guard the entrance to the garden and prevent them from being able to come back in. Their sons are offering offerings, presumably with the intent of trying to atone for sin, that they recognize that not only have they committed, but they are accountable for to this holy God who perhaps they are not too far from in proximity because they would probably be right outside the garden, having not moved too far away from it. Uh, and of course, Cain, once he slays Abel, moves further east off into the land of Nod. And then human civilization is born and begins to flourish, but flourish in bad ways because it's not as though they are attempting to try to improve their lot in life. Everything that they are doing is just simply for the pursuit of their own pleasures until, again, we get the very thing that God says as he sums up in this verdict style statement 
in this courtroom scenario almost that humanity is guilty of perpetual rebellion against him and filling his good creation with evil, tainting it to the point where now it's beyond repair in the sense that humanity is not turning themselves back to the Lord, that there is a line of descendants from Adam through Seth in which people have begun to call upon the name of the Lord. They worship him, but yet it is not having the drastic influence of turning hearts back to the Lord. And so now we have but seemingly one man and his family who remain loyal to the Lord. And with that, God is choosing to salvage them, not because they simply remain loyal to the Lord, but God in his grace in other words, Noah did not work for this, but God in his grace chooses to save Noah because Noah, as he is a man, is guilty of his own measures of brokenness. We see evidence of that after the flood. And then, of course, in all of that, we see clear patterns of sin that must have had root already in Noah for the hundreds of years he lived prior to the flood before God reveals himself to Noah and then begins to commission him to build the ark. So he builds the ark right? And the rest of creation is destroyed. But notice what is said to Noah after the flood is ended, and they begin to disembark from the ark itself. And we have the recommissioning of humanity as headed now by Noah, 10 generations removed from Adam. And the very words that God had spoken to mankind in Genesis chapter 1, when he blesses them, and he tells them, as he also told the animals, and the trees to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth with their kind. So Noah, in a sense, becomes a very real and very new Adam. And of course, he is not given this kingly language in the direct way that Adam is in Genesis 1. But I don't think we can really escape it when you go on to read the rest of these words when he says that the fear and terror of you will be on every living creature. So they will be subservient to you in the sense that they should not rise up to challenge your authority. And if they do, they will be held accountable. And then he goes on to say in a very blunt way that I have given you everything. So to say that everything has been placed underneath Noah's care would for all intent and purpose, basically make him a new king over this new creation that God has forged from the chaotic waters that he unleashed from the great fountains of the deep and opening up the windows of heaven, flooding the earth, receding that water. And in the act of Genesis 1, in the six successive days of creation, while we don't have six successive days listing this out for us in order like it does in Genesis 1, yet God is bringing dry land out. He's allowing vegetation to flourish and he's going to repopulate the earth with those creatures that have the breath of life that he breathed into them man and animal alike created on the same day, right? So everything is put back right, and then God chooses not to destroy it again. He's going to allow everything to continue on as it does into this very day. The point is, is that as God has coronated mankind in Genesis 1, he is re-coronating mankind under a new figurehead, that being Noah in Genesis chapter 9. And then when we move into the next major story, we go into Genesis 12, where God is speaking to this man named Abram, after the events of Genesis 11 with Babel and another fall type of narrative with respect to humanity as a whole sinning against God and God bringing judgment through dispersing them after he confounds their languages, right? And then on the very heels of that, from the wreckage of all of that, and the heart of the area of the world where those events took place, Babel becoming uh, the first kingdom of the world post-flood that eventually gives rise to the the nation uh, and city Babylon, God comes to this Mesopotamian man, Abram, and he says, go from your land, your relatives, your father's house to the land I will show you. He, he tells him, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, as opposed to those before you who said that they would make a great name for themselves. I will make your name great. I'll bless you. And of course, you are to bless all the peoples of the earth through your family. As of yet, he has no family. So how God is going to make this happen well for those of us who are familiar enough with the storyline of scripture we understand how this plays out but from this vantage point it remains to be seen but you know years will go by more than a decade and god is going to appear to abraham in genesis 17 and at this point when abraham is now 99 and he has a son ishmael has been born the lord appears to him and he says i am el shaddai or god almighty so live walk in my presence be blameless 
and I have set up my covenant with you. As Abraham prostrates himself before the Lord, God gives him the covenant sign of circumcision, changes his name from Abram now to Abraham, the father of many nations, right? So again, this is the purpose behind why God has called and commissioned Abraham in the first place is to make him the father of many nations, meaning there's going to be a multi-ethnic family attached to Abraham in the process of time. It will not materialize in Abraham's day, but it will, of course, in the ensuing centuries that lead us up to where we are right now in the current storyline of Scripture. Because even in the descent of a, uh, Abraham's people under this point, which is reflected in the genealogy that Matthew opens his gospel up with, there have already been people of Canaanite, Moabite origin, that had an even Egyptian origin, although that's not part of the genealogy given from Abraham all the way down to Jesus. But yeah, we know this from other parts in the Old Testament, namely Exodus, that at various points, other people groups have intermingled themselves into the storyline of Israel and, of course, have taken wives, taken husbands from other ethnic groups. And with that, they have progenated a mixed race of people that are no longer purely descended in every respect from Abraham. Many are still, but many are not. Many have, again, uh, intermingled their genetic uh, lines. And that's OK. And I say that's OK, because when we go back to actually read and study the Old Testament, you won't find that they are actually forbidden to marry with other people. It's just the stipulation that it's not a wise practice for you to do this in an unrestrained way, because the greatest tendency and danger that you'll fall into is that, and we see this play out very keenly in the life of Solomon, that you perhaps in giving your sons and daughters to these people and taking their sons and daughters to be your children's wives and husbands, that it will lead you then to give your heart over to the gods that they worship. But in the unique circumstances of people like Rahab and Ruth, others who chose to leave behind what formerly defined them as a Canaanite or a Moabite or what have you, and joining themselves unto the Lord's people, as Ruth uh, very plainly said to Naomi, your God will be my God, your people, my people. I choose to adopt and embrace the customs that define you as a people. And of course, the God that you give your obedience and obedience to. And while Rahab never said those things, it's, I think, very clearly understood. That's what wind up, wind, winds up happening after the destruction of Jericho. In fact, there are provisions in the law that Moses gives to the people that if they marry an Egyptian or a Moabite or an Ammonite, then there are restrictions as to how many generations must come from that marital union before that people uh, or the, 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 those descendants from that union are allowed to become part of the general assembly of the larger community of Israel and be recognized as legitimate descendants. That doesn't mean that they're bastardized. It just means full inheritance privileges that are assigned to them. So that means that several people would have the chance then to marry Moabites or Ammonites. But again, it means that they should not do so in an uninhibited and unrestricted way. There would be the understanding that that was the expectation that the Moabite or the Ammonite would embrace not only the customs, but even the very God of Israel leaving behind their pantheon of deities. And we don't have very many recorded instances of this sort of thing happening. So Abraham's family will become multi-ethnic in that sense. And of course, it's got its eye on the great prize of what we have in the New Testament once his heir, Jesus, comes along and then opens up this possibility for all mankind to become part of Abraham's ethnic family. But the interesting thing about this is this is the first time that God reveals to Abraham that not only will nations, but kings will come from him. But we understand in this part of the storyline that the concept of one man reigning over all humanity has not really been abandoned, but in some ways it's been shelved. There is not a connection now that exists between all humanity that once did before the events of the Tower of Babel. They're all fractured in their own little niches as nations with loyalties to their own kings and, of course, their own languages that they speak. And these kings do what kings do at this time in human history, and that is attempt to try to amass more territory and with that more slaves, more revenue streams, 
and a longer lasting legacy and dynasty for their descendants after them. And the concept of being immortalized forever and ever through their great deeds that are forged in stone or clay tablets that will be rem remembered till time no more. And of course, uh, you know, a, a great spot in their concept of the afterlife after this, when they are venerated by the gods that they served with great rewards in the life to come. So the idea of one man reigning over all humanity has now become a little foreign to not only the ancient world, but even to the writers of scripture to an extent, because we're not really focusing on the idea at this moment of one king taking up that mantle, because we are told that kings will come from Abraham. And this is true in more ways than one, a line of kings through one man, David, but even other nations that will descend from Abraham, such as Midian and whatnot, will have their own kings that rule over them. So all that to say, what we do see embedded here, but waiting to fully fruess, a simple seed in Genesis 17 that's going to blossom into a beautiful tree as the biblical narrative continues to develop moving beyond this. But the idea is simply that there is a promise of a king embedded in the word kings. And then in Genesis 37, we get a crazy but awesome glimpse of this when this boy, Joseph, a descendant of Abraham, has a dream that he really can't explain to his brothers and, of course, his, even his own father. Not to say he didn't understand the implications of the things he's describing when he says, I had another dream. This time the sun, moon and 11 stars were bowing to me. Even his excuse me, father and brothers understood what this meant when they asked him, as his brothers already had with the dream of the sheaves, or the sheaves, I should say, bowing down. They recognized that he intended to rule over them. And now his father says, what kind of dream is this that you had? Am I and your mother and your brothers really going to bow down before you while his brothers are seething with jealousy? Yet J uh, Jacob ponders this in his heart, much in the same way that Jesus' own mother with the statements made by Simeon and Anna when they go to dedicate the tiny Christ child in the temple will also ponder in their hearts the things that are said about him. All that to say, though, Joseph probably clearly understood that he is going to arise to at least the level of chieftain of sorts because it's not that big of a group, right? I mean, at the end of the Genesis narrative, there's a little more than 70 that will migrate out of the land of Canaan that bear the name and title Hebrew that will come down into the vicinity of Egypt to set up house there, right? We have no record of anybody else. The idea is the that the land of Canaan has been completely emptied of Abraham's people at the close of the Genesis narrative as they have taken up residence in the land of Goshen in Egypt per Pharaoh's invitation. But in this part of the narrative, Joseph graduates into this very position in a, a way and on a scale that perhaps he never could have dreamed of and now becoming the vizier of Pharaoh in Egypt and ruling over the entirety of the land subject only to Pharaoh's authority. Much in the same way that we see Adam ruling over the entirety of the earth albeit it's only him and Eve at the beginning of that story and all the animals inside the garden. But everything else, though it's somewhat untamed, undeveloped outside the garden, is still Adam's because God has placed it underneath Adam's headship. And the idea is that Adam will rule over all of those image bearers that will come from him, but they will also share in power and authority as kings and queens and priests as well. All that to simply say, though, that we get a, a synopsis here of what God is intending to do with Abraham's people. He has promised multiple times in his appearings to Abraham that this is what he intends, a massive nation, and then, of course, multiple nations, all connected to Abraham's people, blessings upon all families of the earth through Abraham's bloodline, and that um, ultimately this is going to work to in some way, lead humanity back to God's favor and God opening himself up to bless all of humanity in this way. <clears throat> but we have no idea at the end of Abraham's life how this is going to transpire until we get to the Joseph narrative and we get to see a glimpse of how God is seemingly going to put this together. He is going to take a man who has been lowly esteemed by his brothers and in many ways, uh, 
while in moments it seems like Joseph is a little bit of a punk, uh, yet in in other ways of looking at that particular part of the narrative, it's also likely that he is being wrongly accused of things that we really don't have a good understanding of how it was that he communicates this information to his brothers. Is he doing it as if he's a bratty child? We know his father favors him. Was that the very thing that fueled the jealousy of his brothers, or was it his demeanor? It could be both. We don't really know the full spectrum of detail, but what we do get an understanding of is that his brothers loathe him. And God is going to take a man who is loathed by his own brethren, and yet though he is not esteemed highly by them, God is going to exalt him in their very eyes, and he will rule over them. But it will not be enough for him to rule over his own people. He is even going to rule over the nations as well. Those who have become the various divergent groups of peoples that have spread out over the earth's surface from the days of the Tower of Babel's events up until the epicenter of human history, when this one man is coronated as king over all humanity and receives all authority on earth. And of course, when we get to the narrative of Jesus, we understand from the words of prophets and psalm writers and singers that this one king is going to rule sovereignly over the cosmos as much as he will be ruling over the nations here on earth as well. But all that to say that we have a good picture of that by the end of the Joseph story, that this one king is going to bless both God's people and the nations together in ruling benevolently over them and unleashing the blessings of Eden to them. The produce of the land of Egypt, in this case, though it was kept under lock and key, up until the end of the seven years of plenty and now in the seven years of famine, it's enough to keep not only the inhabitants of Egypt alive, but even faraway lands such as Canaan as well. And then we get into the story of David in 2 Samuel 7. But what's interesting here is we have a parallel passage because in 2 Samuel 7, we get this clear understanding that God, after he speaks through Nathan to say to David, you know, I didn't really tell anybody to build me a house of cedar or anything like that. But I see what you're doing and I appreciate the fact that you want to honor me. And so by you honoring, uh, wanting to honor me, it's only right huh, that I honor you first before you honor me. And so with that, God says, I took you from the pasture land, tending to the flock to be ruler over my people, Israel. But even though David is just a regional king in this area, at this particular point, David has conquered quite a bit of territory outside of just Israel itself. He is working to press toward the ends of those boundaries that were described first by Moses and then by Joshua to not only take over all the land that they should have possessed under the time of Joshua and the period of the judges once these tribes were released to go and finish the conquest in their inheritances that were drawn up by casting lots before Joshua and Eleazar, the high priest, at the tabernacle. David is doing all of that now, and he's going beyond that, because after this moment of God's benevolent promise, David will go on to continue launching campaigns in Moab and Edom, various other places, and he will subdue all of these regional powers underneath his own crown. And of course, this is going to pass on to his son, and the dynasty that will be forged after him per this promise of the Lord. And it's not to just simply rule over them and subjugate them as a lower order of people. But the idea is bringing to pass the blessing of Abraham by slowly, methodically, and systematically turning the hearts of the people over subsequent generations away from the gods that they have made for themselves and turn back to the one true God that they have all known about from the beginning of creation, right? And we know that they have known about this God because Paul tells us in Romans chapter one that God has revealed himself. They have suppressed that truth in unrighteousness, but it's still there just under the surface. But nonetheless, he says, and I will make a great name for you. He gives him the very promise of Abraham, like that of the greatest of the earth. But the funny thing is, as he says, and I pointed this out months ago, I'll designate a place for my people, Israel, and plant them. And he says this in this futuristic tense so that they will live there and not be disturbed again. But the idea is that you would think that he's already done this because it's been centuries now since Israel has been planted in the land of Canaan. As if to say Canaan is a brand new garden of Eden and like the trees planted in the original garden, 
that these are new trees planted in the garden that are meant to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with the fruit of living in right relationship with God and man, right? And turning the hearts of the people to God. All that to say, we've heard this language before. Back in Exodus 15, the victory psalm, or what is said in Hebrew as being the song of the sea. When Israel has come through the walls of water um, that God opens up in the midst of the Red Sea for them to cross through and now has destroyed the Egyptians. And as Moses is leading them in this victory psalm, he goes on to say toward the terminal end of it that the peoples will hear it. They'll shudder. Anguish will seize the inhabitants of Philistia, Moab, Edom. They're all named here. And they will stand there petrified like stone out of their sheer terror that will overcome them until God's people pass by the people that he has purchased, ransoming them out of Egypt, right? Bondage, slavery, oppression. All that to say, the peoples are standing in both fear and awe as God is taking a people he's purchased for himself and planting them on the mountain of his possession that he is prepared for his dwelling place where he will take up residence there in his sanctuary, but in this religious setting that is uh, a place where cultic practice will occur with respect to the shedding of blood for the atonement of sin and keeping sacred space open for God and man to dwell together. It will also be the very palace by which God's presence will be established on the earth, and his seat of power and authority will uh, forever stand. As Moses says, the Lord as king will reign forever. And you're like, okay, I'm not really sure what that means. Well, carry this over here to what is said. Woo. Carry that to what is said over here in Second Samuel chapter 7, and it's almost the exact same language of God planning his people. The idea is that God is not finished with this project yet because it's not reached its terminal end of these people whom God has ransomed for himself to be the conduit by which he is going to bring the blessings of Eden that he promised would <clears throat> flow through Abraham's family and some way, somehow through a king that he will exalt to the throne at his right hand that will rule beside him. God has his seat of power on his mountain where he has planted his people and his sanctuary, and he is going to invite this exalted son of man to rule beside him, right? Psalm 2 is the beginning play, uh, phase of us understanding how God is going to exalt this human figure to rule at his side, and it gets expounded upon in several places. They're not all right beside each other, and so it's easy for us to not pick up the pieces if we're reading sequentially through chapter by chapter, book by book, and its layout for us as it stands in the English or Protestant compilation of the Bible. Not to say it would be that much easier to pick up on if we picked up a Hebrew copy of the Old Testament translated for us in English, but with the books compiled the way that they have them. It may be a little bit easier, but nonetheless, point being, Psalm 2 is one of the first places we see the proclamation coming from what God has laid down in 2 Samuel 7, when he says, this son that I'm going to bring from you, he will be my son. And then in Psalm 2, it is said, today you are my son. I have begotten you. And then this king who is going to rule over the nations, as it is said in Psalm 2 also, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, becomes the subject of Psalms like Psalm 45 or Psalm 72, and listen to the words of this psalm when the writer says, my heart is moved by a noble theme as I recite verses to the king. But notice the king uh, or king that as a word is not capitalized here. So it's just the actual son of David, presumably Solomon. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most handsome of men. Grace flows from your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Mighty warrior. The very same phrase, I think, that's used in Isaiah chapter 9 to describe the very one who is going to be born. The child who was born to us, the son that is given, right? Strap a sword at your side. And your majesty and splendor in the, your splendor ride triumphantly in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. May your right hand show your awe-inspiring acts. Your sharpened arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. 
the peoples fall under you. So he is going to exercise dominion over the earth, right? Then notice what is said here. Your throne, God, is forever and ever. Now you might think, well, frame is shifting focus here. It's no longer talking about this earthly king, the presumed son of David. It is now speaking about the one who rules sovereignly over the cosmos, but that's not true. This is still with the, the Davidic descendant in mind here, the idea that there will be a son from the loins of David who will be spoken of in this way, using this Isaiah-like language from Isaiah chapter 9, who while born as a son of man will yet be also referred to as God Almighty. So your throne, God, is forever and ever. The writer of Hebrews picks up on this, speaking about the very thing that is captured here and the language that is carried over with respect to a particular human descendant being the one who will fulfill this role. And it was none of the de descendants of David that we see until we get to Jesus. But nonetheless, I digress because he goes on to say, the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You love righteousness, hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of joy more than your companions. So the psalmist is addressing God and saying that his God has anointed him with the oil of joy more than his companions. Myrrh and aloes, cassia, perfume, perfume your garments. <laughs> and what's ironic about that is that those things perfume the very garments that Jesus is buried in, in the funerary procession, bringing him from Golgotha's hill to the stone-carved tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, when he has been exalted in death, right? Exalted in humiliation to be coronated as the suffering king over his own people to bring them in like a new Moses into a new creation where they as a brand new humanity will become the seeds and fruit of the very epis, uh, the epitome of the promise given to Abraham uh, as being a father of many nations. King's daughters are among your honored women. I mean, how many times do we see Jesus exalting women to the equal status of men <clears throat> uh, in not to say in ministerial roles or anything like that, but you get what I'm saying as we read through the, the, the gospel narratives and whatnot. The queen adorned with gold from Ophir stands at your right hand. So in many ways, this ties into an actual physical descendant that comes from David. And no doubt these words were said and spoken of many Davidic descendants that ruled in Jerusalem, but none would fully fill out the whole bill here until we get to Jesus. And the same can be said for Psalm 72. God, give your justice to the king and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your afflicted ones with justice. May the righteous flourish in his days and well-being abound until the moon is no more. And may he rule from sea to sea, that being the Mediterranean, of course, to the Dead Sea, and from the Euphrates to the ends of the earth. So until we get to Euphrates, all of that was not only present in the days of David, but also Solomon. But never would it be said that any of these Davidic descendants would rule to the ends of the earth, except for the one who, like in Psalm 45, will be the very one who, as God, is spoken to by his God as being the one anointed with oil of joy more than all the rest of his companions. May desert tribes kneel before him and enemy his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and the coasts and the islands bring tribute the kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. So we're talking about the furthest depths that one could get to with respect to the map or had knowledge of, as goes Sheba and, and uh, Seba and Dedan are way down south in the Arabian Peninsula, now present-day Saudi Arabia. And Tarshish as far west as either uh, the Italian island of Sardinia or maybe even the coasts of Spain. And of course, none of that ever fell under the purview of any Davidic king, right? So we're literally talking about the edges of the map with a phrase like coasts and islands. Let all kings bow in homage to him. All nations serve him. So, you know, again, the idea is that he is going to become the sovereign potentate who will truly rule over the earth like a new Adam figure where everything is placed under his feet. And of course, this is the very thing that's built into the phrase that Jesus says, capping off Matthew's gospel with all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. He is now the sovereign potentate of all the nations. He has been from the very moment where he said those words. And before that, you know, when he was exalted 
in being resurrected from the dead. He has claimed that victorious title, power, and authority for himself, right? And so this very king will be the one who will rescue the poor, who cry out, the afflicted who have no helper. He will have pity on the poor and helpless. So all of those who are the downcast, and not only in the physical material sense, but of course, all those who are held captive by the very sway and power of sin over their lives. And uh, he will bring this measure of redemption and rescue from this oppressiveness to the ends of the world, the dominion that is his. <clears throat> because all of their lives are precious in his sight and may all nations be blessed by him and call him blessed. That is Abrahamic language of Genesis chapter 12, 15, 17, and of course, 22. So let me just sum up here before I get into Romans and to say that hopefully what we are coming to understand is that God has established the one who he created in his likeness to bear his image as being the one that would rule at his side. And he gave him the dominion of all the earth to subdue. But man forfeited that by his actions in Genesis chapter three. But God did not shelve that project. God has continued to press that forward throughout the rest of human history that is condensed for us in the scriptural narrative. The reason why God chooses to salvage one family above all families in the context of the flood and then recommission and coronate them with these kingly titles and more so kingly language of what their mandate is from Genesis 1 now in Genesis 9 with Noah and his family is because God chooses to still use this image-bearing creation of his to rule at his side and to express his nature and his image to the rest of creation and represent creation before him and share his authority and power with. Why? Don't know. <laughs> Why does he love us in spite of our multiple failings? Don't know. There's really no uh, concise answer that just sums all of that up in a way that we're like, I got it now, right? I just know why God loves us in spite of us being the miserable wretches that we are. But nonetheless, God begins to promise this through one childless man saying, you're not great, but I'm going to make you great. And you don't have a family, but I'm going to give you a family and more family than you could ever possibly know what to do with. But your family is going to rival the stars in heaven for number. And you're going to be the father of a multitude of nations, even though you're only going to have a handful of kids by the end of your life. And your descendants after you're going to be so great, kings will rule over the nations that progenate from you. And one king will rise above them all to be the one that is going to bring blessing to the rest of the nations. But Abraham doesn't know that, that we have record of before he dies. But when we get to the lives of his great grandchildren, Joseph, we see what God's picture is going to look like in the far flung future. That after they leave Egypt, God is going to plant these people, per the song of Moses in Exodus 15, in the land of Canaan, that he is going to clear out from the filth of all of the Canaanite tribes and planting them there like a new garden of Eden. He is going to establish them so that they can grow tall and strong like trees in Eden and they can produce the fruit that will permeate the world with God's blessings and draw the hearts of men back to him. And of course, Israel, as we see in the many stories that we've read or have seen in the many stories that we've read over these successive months, has botched that in so many ways. But God has not given up on that. He's punished. He's chastised. He's disciplined. He's tried to recorral his people back in line with that purpose. And while they have been so stubborn, yet God has not given up on them. And this graciousness, yet he has severely chastised them as we're about to read in the coming weeks after this with respect to what really happened in the exile and how they recovered after that, that God did not exterminate his people. In all of his anger, he was not done with them. Instead, he lovingly restores them and continues to use them as a witness to his goodness and grace to the rest of the world who is he is trying to reach out to through these broken people, Israel. All right. And that, of course, is pointing up to this crescendo moment in time when we do finally have the one son of man, the last Adam, who is going to bring about a new humanity through his own exaltation through death. And, of course, his ultimate uh, exaltation with respect to his resurrection and ascension into heaven and bringing together heaven and earth 
by combining them under his own headship and authority, becoming the exalted son of Daniel 7, the one who was brought before the Ancient of Days and given a kingdom whose dominion and authority will never end. So in Romans 1, it's not lost on me that the context of this chapter is actually the Gentile nations. However, I think much of this also applies to the nation of Israel as well. And I think Paul means as much when he says in the beginning of chapter two, do you think you're any better? Paraphrasing, of course, but do you really think you're any better off than them? I mean, after all, they walked in darkness. God did not reveal himself to them in this way, and he did not covenant with them, but he did you, and yet you do all the very things that you preach against them as doing. You know not to steal, and yet you steal. They weren't told by God not to steal, and yeah, they steal, and they break the law, and it's easy to see why God's judgment rests on them, but you still do it. How much more does his judgment rest on you? And seemingly the exile and restoration back to the land didn't change that, because Paul is saying this is been the legacy of our people, both before and after the exile. But anyway, so a generic statement that basically applies to all mankind, though focused toward the Gentiles in Romans chapter one, for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodless or all godlessness and righteousness, that what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them, right? I mean, after all, <clears throat> has this not been the theme of what we have been studying now for several months? that God has indeed revealed his wrath from heaven against the godlessness and unrighteousness against Israel, because that has been the one of the prominent themes of what we've looked at with respect to their persistent idolatry that has plagued them from the days of their exodus from Egypt, and even while they were in Egypt, right? And if you go back and read the words of Ezekiel, you'll find out that while they were in Egypt, they were already worshiping the gods of Egypt. And God apparently contemplated destroying them in Egypt, but he didn't. Instead, he sent them Moses. He delivered them out of Egypt and sought to purge them from that idolatry. But he never left. They never laid it down in spite of all the things that he did to reveal himself. And we see this coming to uh, full fruition in Exodus 32, while Moses is up on the mountain and everybody else is at the base. Moses is up there receiving, talking to the Lord. And they are down at the bottom of the mountain. Aaron is taking the spoils and plunder of Egypt, turning it into a golden calf that they are going to prostrate themselves to. And God says to Moses, I have seen this people, and they are indeed a stiff-necked people. So leave me alone that my anger can burn against them and I can destroy them, right? What can be known about God was as evident as ever to them because we understand very clearly that God had revealed himself from the moment he began to visit them in Egypt, before Moses even goes to Pharaoh, he assembles the elders of the people and reveals to them all the signs, the turning of his staff into a snake, the uh, smiting of his own flesh with leprosy when he reaches his hand into his cloak. He didn't even have to get to the third sign of pouring out water and it turning into blood, but God had armed him with as much. So just in case those first two were not enough. And so they clearly understand that God is the one who has sent Moses, that he is not some sort of sorcerer or whatever that is just conjuring up dark magic. And of course, the rest of that is as evident as can be when God preserves them through all of the plagues and he uh, brings the torture upon Egypt. And the same thing happens again in Numbers 14, right? When at this point, they completely reject the program of the Exodus. They don't want to go into the land. They instead want to kill Moses and then elect a new leader with one singular focus. And that is get us on the quickest path down to Egypt so that we can just sell ourselves back to the new Pharaoh in perpetual, never ending slavery. And we will be happy to be slaves there and never have any future for ourselves and just die there as someone else's property. So. The Lord says to Moses, how long will these people despise me? How long will they not trust me in spite of everything I have performed before them? So I will strike them with a plague and destroy them. So again, just more evidence from what we've read that God intended to destroy his people more than once because of their heinous rejection of him. And in Exodus 19, we see, I think what Paul is kind of hinting to here when he says what God or what can be known about God is evident among them. Again, I understand this is for Gentiles. So his invisible attributes, his power is present enough in creation to know that he is the one that put all of this together. 
and sustains it and provides for even them with his common grace in spite of the fact that they don't turn to him. But this is no less true for Israel and all the more true for Israel, considering the very ways that God has revealed himself to them. Exodus 19, Moses comes down from the mountain to the people to consecrate them, tell them to wash their clothes. He says, be prepared by the third day. So take three days to do this, because on the third day, when morning came, there was thunder, lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, a very loud blast from the ram's horn. All the people in the camp shuddered, They're terrified. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai, completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. And its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in the thunder. And many of them will have the chance on that very day to go up on the mountain and see probably Jesus <laughs> because it's a humanoid figure that is suspended over what appears to be a plane of glass and what it looks like to them is either sapphire or lapis lazuli depending upon whatever your translation might say but it is said by moses that they see the very god of heaven and the elders and the priests aaron and his two sons joshua and moses all dine in his presence and god does not strike or hurt them so there, there is no possible way that they could have any more of god revealed to them and live to survive through the encounter, to be the very dynamic for world-changing force that God meant for them to be, per his words to Abraham, other than in this way. But what happens? We go back to Paul. For they knew God, yet they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless. Their senseless hearts were darkened. They claimed to be wise, but they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. So <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 17, the author gives us a summary statement for why it was that Israel as the northern kingdom, and he'll go on a few chapters later to say virtually the same thing with the southern kingdom of Judah, as to why exactly they were expelled from the land. I mean, and of course, we could bring in many other threads of thought from Moses and his words in Deuteronomy, the understanding that Moses knew these people would do this. God revealed as much to him when he said, as soon as you die and they enter the land, they will indeed turn away from me. All that to say, what he says almost a millennium later is that the Israelites had secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. They built high places and they set up for themselves sacred pillars, Asherah poles on every high hill and under every green tree, basically creating a small little Garden of Eden, mimicking the sacred space where God and man met together and man was supposed to worship God and, of course, fill the world with God's wisdom. Had they continued to do what God had commissioned them to do in the garden, but instead of them worshiping God on every high hill, which was not allowed under Mosaic law, yet they're worshiping these deities, which makes it all the more blasphemous and wrong. They burned incense there on these high places, just like the nations that the Lord had driven out before them had done. They do all these evil things, angering God. They served idols. So what again, Paul is saying here in Romans is as true of Israel as it was the pagan nations, right? And God had been patient and forbearing with them. He had sent his prophets to them to exercise uh, some measure of justice with respect to reminding these people of the covenant they had entered into with God and what God was ingratiated and obligated to do should they persist on this course of action. And yet they never turn their hearts away from them. They compel them, turn from your evil ways, keep my commands, but instead they choose to kill just about every one of these prophets. Almost none of them made it to a ripe old age and just died a natural death with the exception of a few like Elisha. Going back to Paul in Romans 1 24. So therefore God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded amongst themselves. Now, of course, there's a theology at work behind this to speak to the idea of homosexuality being rampant in certain areas and whatnot, and God allowing them, as he did in the context of Genesis chapter 3, this is what you want, a world to rule without me in it? Okay, that's what I'll give you, and you'll see how terrible it is. 
and you won't be able to reverse that course and come back to take back what you had been granted me. Instead, this is the consequence you live with. And ultimately, God allows them to be consumed in their sin, as goes what Paul is speaking about with the way that these people were given over to their sexual impurity. But again, this is no less true of Israel. And the point I keep I'm trying to make in, in continually drawing Israel back into the frame of reference of Romans 1, even though Paul isn't really doing that, is to say, again, yes, they are just as bad as the nations, uh, but also to say uh, or try to help us understand that what we've been studying now for these several weeks has not been in vain. And as goes this one lesson, it also creeps into this lesson in these very pervasive ways such as Hosea 4, where God is speaking to the prophet saying, I will not punish your daughters when they act promiscuously or your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery, because the men themselves go off with prostitutes and they make sacrifices with cult prostitutes and people without discernment are doomed. So in other words, as you've heard me say in some lessons before, this was part of one of the reasons why a cultic, again, not cultic, occultic practice was so reprehensible in God's eyes, especially given the fact that Baalism, which of course, you know, Baal is not the only God who has, as the chief of the pantheon, has a female consort. There were many other ancient civilizations who had parallel gods that were responsible for very similar functions that would have a female consort. And the idea is that when these two gods or the God and goddess get together and sexually copulate, not only is it possible they may actually have divine offspring, but the idea would be that because they are doing what they are doing, their act of reproduction stimulates the earth to go through its act of reproduction and thereby bring about the following harvest and uh, crop and harvest cycles that will continue to perpetuate life amongst their faithful worshipers. And Israel gave themselves to this practice as much as the Canaanites did before them. And that's the very thing that Paul in this context, is referencing here as he's winking at Israel with respect to this, but of course, dressing down the Gentiles for being responsible for the same thing. So all that to put us on par with the idea that while Israel had been commissioned with this incredibly important responsibility of working as a sanctified nation to try to sanctify the other nations and drawing them attracting them to the one true God who rules over the cosmos and to abandon the pleasures of their flesh and the brokenness of their spirit and giving themselves over to these pleasures. Yet they themselves were ultimately consumed by the thing that they felt was more appealing and attractive than the very God who they were trying to attract the world to or should have been. And so that leads us up to the time period of the exile, right? When God is seeking to ultimately purge them of this. And when we read through the words of these pre-exilic prophets, Isaiah and his many contemporaries, Amos, Jonah, Hosea, Micah, and so forth, and that we see that God has destined his people for judgment, and he is going to permanently purge them of this, what at this point has been an insatiable appetite for this measure of apostasy and blasphemy. And when he renews them by nearly destroying them, heating them up in the crucible the way that silver is for the sake of getting rid of all of its dross and impurities and making it as pure and refined as possible, but at a great cost to the silver itself, namely these people and what they'll have to go through. That when he brings them back to the land, in the words of Isaiah and many others, and then we get into the prophets in the heat of the exile, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the same thing, and it's no less for those post-exilic prophets, speaking about the advent of Messiah. From the pre-exilic prophets and the prophets in the exile itself, it seems like there this hope is going to be commensurate and consummate when the exile is over. Daniel, speaking a, along these very lines in Daniel 9, when he's recognizing, hey, we're almost to the end of this 70-year period of captivity. And he's praying for the restoration of the people in spite of the fact they don't deserve it. They haven't even repented of their sins, but he's hopeful that God will be faithful to his word and overlook what they've done, forgiving rather than holding them accountable any more than he has. All that to say that it would seem the idea would be as we're getting to the end of the 70 year period, Messiah is going to appear at some point. 
this new David figure, and he is going to lead us out of this captivity and into a permanent, never-ending kingdom in which the prosperity of the nations will be ours because they're going to literally be bringing it in by wagon loads to us. But it doesn't materialize that way. And then we get five centuries on into the future with Jesus, and we see that Israel is still under captivity. They're moaning for their redemption. But that redemption is more or less deliverance from the captivity under Rome's boot, not so much deliverance from the oppression of sin. They don't think they're really in need of that. But Jesus knows there's much more at stake here. And so the idea is that first redemption must begin with deliverance from sin before the rest of creation can be fully restored and remade in an inverted style. Whereas God in Genesis 1 makes everything, capping it off with the, the final act of creation, and that is man. Now it's reworking this by recreating man, renewing man as a new humanity that is then going to be the agents he sends out to the broken, twisted, corrupt, crooked world to work to remake it by establishing God's presence and kingdom rule over all of creation, which was man's original mandate. It wasn't a broken, twisted, crooked world until man sinned. But man was supposed to fill the earth with the wisdom and knowledge of God and bring everything under God's headship. It already was. But the point is, is that as man was working to subdue the earth, he is also simultaneously bringing it all underneath not only his own, but ultimately God's headship as he spread his kingdom. So we get to a phrase or a passage like this in 2 Corinthians 3, where he says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all now with unveiled faces, you know, he's referencing back to that moment in the stories of Torah, where Moses is in the Lord's presence, either on the mountain or that special tent. And when he comes out of it, his face is radiating from God's glory. Right. And he says that we don't have to wear that kind of veil. Right. And for us, the veil has been lifted as the Lord has opened up our hearts to hear the truth of his word and allowed us to respond in faith. He says that we are looking as in a mirror. In other words, the Lord's glory is being reflected back to us, and we are reflecting the Lord's glory back to him as we are being transformed into the same image, ultimately the very image of Jesus as the iconic human being going from the glory that we once were as Broken human beings get still in some way reflecting God's image. Now, as restored human beings to a greater sense of glory, being restored back to the glory we once had before Adam chose to do what he did, and we all repeated the same mistake. And this, of course, comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, tie this over into what Paul is saying in Acts chapter 2, where, I'm sorry, what Peter is saying in uh, Acts chapter 2, when in his first sermon on the day of Pentecost, he is reciting the very words of Joel, and he is saying that those words are now being fulfilled because those Jews present there for the observance of the Feast of Passover, I'm sorry, Pentecost, were seeing how God has poured out his spirit now on all people, sons, daughters, old men, young men, everybody, both servants, male and female, God is going to pour out his spirit. And they will prophesy. They will speak his truth. And as they go to the furthest edges of creation, carrying with them God's truth, speaking it into the world and permeating it with the life that it brings. What we are now seeing is the beginning of the renewal of all things. It's not fully consummate yet. Jesus is not present amongst us in the world still, of course. Well, I should say he's not present in the way that we have in the closing pages of the book of Revelation that is hinted at. By guys like Isaiah and whatnot, with respect to God's kingdom fully present amongst mankind, as God has now attached himself to us in living and ruling amongst us physically from now through eternity. That is yet to come. But when it does come, it will have come after millennia worth. And who knows how much time we have left in doing this? Maybe centuries yet still, millennia worth of his kingdom slowly growing remember the words in the parable of jesus when he says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that's planted in the ground that does not like jack's magic beanstalk beans go from being planted in the ground 
uh, the evening before and the very next day is a mighty beanstalk that goes from the surface of the ground right outside his house all the way up into the clouds where the giant's castle is. This is a tree that will eventually sprout from the slow, methodical, mechanical process of the seed opening up and letting the germination process ensue. And over the months that will come after that, a sprout jump up from the ground. But that is not the terminal end. The terminal end is this great big bush-like tree that's big enough for birds to be able to perch and nest in, right? So how much time does that take? Years upon years upon years of patient waiting. 2,000-ish from our perspective. But again, who knows how much more? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like that little batch of yeast that is put into the lump of dough that after it's been kneaded in there effectively and then it begins to bake, the slow process of the heat causing the bread to do its chemical thing and rise and eventually that yeast permeates the whole batch of dough in the finished product of the baked loaf of bread, right? So it's, it's not going to be a, there it is, right? All that to say, we begin in places in the gospel like Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 and various other places and various other gospels get very good hints and glimpses and full breakdowns of synopsises of what it looks like to be living under Jesus's kingdom authority. Because when we look in uh, Luke chapter 10, in this parable of what we might call the Good Samaritan, before we get to that, let's see something of a quick breakdown of what this chapter is painting for us picture-wise. We don't want to take the parable of the Good Samaritan and surgically excise it out of this context and read it on its own. It's embedded as it is amongst these surrounding passages in the larger context by Luke because it's meant to amp up the theme that he is laying down for us in that chapter. So in the first two verses, all the way up to verse nine, we have the appointing now of 72. You know, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus sends out the 12 in groups of two. Now he has sent out the, sent out the larger mass of disciples, 72 in teams of two, and he sends them out into all the towns ahead of him. Again, they're all Jewish, but these presumably are allowed to maybe go out into the towns of the Gentiles. But the idea is that is because it's 72, that number itself is supposed to mimic the amount of nations that were carved out after the dispersion at Babel. 70 nations, so 72, speaking to the fact that in the future, once Jesus commissions his disciples to begin the process of carrying this message beyond and do his, beyond his time and do this work after him, that he will be sending them to the nations, right? Acts chapter one, you'll be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, right? He tells them the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send more workers. And he tells those who are going to be working now, heal the sick who are there, when you go into these towns and you are to tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. So the kingdom has arrived, right? The kingdom has arrived and it's evidenced by virtue of the fact that that power as spoken of by Isaiah and Isaiah 25 and 35 is breaking into your story here and now to demonstrate to you that all things are being made new, that people are being released from the scourge and oppressiveness of sin and other things that have become the consequence of sin breaking the world from the fall of mankind in Genesis chapter 3. And that is the sickness, the demon possession, even death that has come upon you, right? As they shared in Jesus's power to really alleviate people from suffering all of these burdens. Then after this, they come back to him, but Jesus then turns and speaks out in the open while he's not in Chorazin. He says, woe to you, Chorazin, and woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, then they would have repented long ago rather than being <clears throat> judged as they were by the words of Isaiah and Ezekiel and so forth. He said, so whoever listens to you listens to me, but whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. 
he's speaking to these towns in this judgmental way because they had not responded in faith by everyone like Nineveh of old, wearing sackcloth, repenting in ashes, pouring their hearts out to God, begging for his mercy as they throw themselves upon it, right? Instead, they're like, yeah, that's nice, some miracles, yeah, whatever, you know, we got a guy over there, he sells amulets and charms, you know, he'll whip up a little miracle or a potion for you too if you need it, no big deal, you know, that's cool, you got some demons out of a guy, hey, you even fix that dude's wonky arm that's been like this forever and a day so yeah go go on and do your thing man whatever yeah preach all that stuff about sin and yeah i'm, I'm not really feeling you on that but anyway instead of responding as they should have <clears throat> instead they just continue on with life as is unimpressed by the message and the deeds and the fact that god's kingdom has indeed come near them jew and gentile alike in these areas but how do that plays in the larger context as he goes on after this, the 72 return and they say, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he speaks to how he is beheld or beholding. We're not going to talk about that now, but nonetheless, Satan falling from heaven like lightning, stripped of all his authority in the heavenly realms. They have the power to trample on the, the snakes in the sense that it's the connection of the imagery there, or the serpent in the garden and whatnot. But the idea is that God's kingdom rule has been restored. What was lost in the garden, what was broken in the garden with respect to fellowship between God and humanity and even humanity amongst themselves is now being restored as Jesus is seizing that authority as the father has given it to him, but seizing it from the enemy who took that from mankind all those millennia ago. And he is now choosing to share it with a renewed humanity. In so much that he says, blessed are the eyes that see the things you see, because I tell you, prophets and kings wanted to see the things that you uh, have seen, but they didn't to hear the things that you have, but they did. not Then he finishes off this chapter with this beautiful <clears throat> parable here when he speaks about the actions of the Samaritan who came along and found the beaten Jewish man who had been robbed probably by his own countrymen who were bandits. And even though a priest and a Levite came by his way, yet had no compassion, probably esteeming this guy to be cursed of God, wanted nothing to do with him because of the impurity it would bring upon them, thinking themselves more important, unconcerned for the fact that a fellow image bearer had been horribly beaten and mangled in this way because of the brokenness of humanity. And yet a person that all Jews loathed and despised, a Samaritan, came by the way. And if anybody had, huh, probably more cause, not right, because right would say it's justifiable, I think. But cause to just kick dirt on this guy or maybe even finish off the job. But instead chose to look on him with compassion as a fellow image bearer. Because Samaritans, you know, claimed as half-breeds as they were, had an understanding of Torah in that day and time. And though it's a, a different version of the Torah with respect to certain historical details being changed, yet it's the idea, uh, or the idea is still present there in Genesis 1, that God created man to bear his likeness and in his image and commissioned him as a priest, coronated him as a king and placed everything under him to subdue and rule over. So the idea being is that you know, this Samaritan recognized the Jew for what he was, a fellow image bearer, and he chose to act like a neighbor, to love him, to do to him what he expected to be done were he in that situation. And remember, the lawyer, when he recited to Jesus what he had learned from the law, the Shema of Deuteronomy 6, and the follow-on conclusion uh, that Moses gives to them in Leviticus 19 of Love your neighbor as yourself, right? But the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Of course, Jesus having isolated these things as being the greatest commandments given to them to observe. That those words are present in Torah. That while they do not assign any authority whatsoever to the prophets who came after them because they're Jewish prophets, versus Samaritans, yet they recognize the authority of Moses in the first five books of Scripture in much the same way that Sadducees do. And with that, the understanding is, is that they probably would have a very clear idea of 
their obligation to do this very thing of Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. And so this Samaritan does that, although it's not under the auspice that he's helping a fellow Samaritan or some foreigner and that he never would have done it to a Jew. He knows exactly who he's doing this to, a Jew, but he recognizes it has nothing to do with their racial divide or tension between them. It has everything to do with the fact that this man bears God's image as much as he does. And so what does this mean with respect to living as a subject of Jesus under his kingdom authority is the very thing that he speaks about in Matthew 5 through 7 with respect to how us living as his kingdom subjects will in every way redefine what it means to live and exist as human beings and our obligations to him and to each other. So you're like, man, this is a lot. Where does this go? All this comes together, I think, very neatly under the clear understanding that in the beginning, God created man and coronated him as king to rule over the dominion he created for him. And he wanted to share in his authority with for the sake of God's glory permeating this realm that he made and combine the cosmos and this realm together for the sake of man and God living together in harmony. And though that it's been broken, and in many ways we see clear evidence to this day, and we might think it's getting worse and worse by the day, yet still what we understand is that God has never abandoned any of this to its own fate. God has mercifully and graciously continued to work to restore every bit of what was forfeited in the opening pages of Scripture. And he has done this through broken individuals like a lustful, lying Abraham or a drunkard like Noah, or again, a lustful, murderous liar like David, um, and others who he has called and covenanted with and commissioned and uh, coordinated as kings and chose to work alongside of as partners to bring us to this precipice where a son born from this lineage of broken individuals is the faithful son that restores all of this and is working to this very day to continue to expand his kingdom and the hearts of those who he is calling to faith and blessing with faith to trust in him and to repent of their sins and seek to be made new, to surrender their old lives over in death with him to be resurrected as new individuals and to live their lives under his authority and to act and behave as he has modeled for them and told them they must. And that's you and me, friends. So the story of the Old Testament is just as relevant to us as the story of the new, because we understand how these themes develop what sense and significance they find in the story of Jesus. And ultimately, we understand through how, how through their brokenness and failures, it was not achievable by any other means other than his perfect. <clears throat> and thankfully, mutable grace that he was willing to give to us for the sake of our redemption and renewal. And of course, our commission to rule alongside him as kings and queens, as John shares with us as he has made us a whole entire kingdom of these um, already. And we share with him as joint heirs in this world and in the world to come, having open access to all the blessings that he has made available to us in from the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, right? So it gives us all the more reason to get busy with the task that is ours. Let's close in prayer. Jesus we are so grateful, Lord, for the time that we've had. Help us to understand how these words are relevant to us and what you mean to us uh, to, to, com to communicate to us through them. Thank you, Lord, for just giving us the chance to understand this story better uh, by spending time in your word. And I pray that through my attempts, Lord, that you would make it clear in every possible way to them what you intend for them to understand and see and myself included, in your holy name. Amen.